Visualize Apple in its early days, now Microsoft, Google, and Amazon in their early stages. If you're looking at these images and thinking that the common point among them is the immense market value these companies have achieved, you're right. However, there's more to it than that. Each of these giants started in a humble and simple way. Their creation was marked by products and services operating perfectly with a rather precarious infrastructure. It's possible that these companies have redefined their strategies over time, but believe me, that's irrelevant. The crucial point is the beginning, the learning, where we acquire skills, develop experiences, and generally start from the basics. These companies are living examples of these processes. It's easy to bet on them today, but it wasn't always like that, especially in the garage days. Fortunately, they had some kind of support from the beginning, something not everyone is fortunate enough to receive. In 1969, João Conrado Guigel, a mechanical engineer, created a genuinely Brazilian car factory with only seven employees, producing four cars per month. Guigel had a goal in mind, to create a robust, economical, and affordable vehicle for the majority of Brazilians. This purpose is reminiscent of what Henry Ford did in the United States when he introduced the famous Model T. Gigel Motors evolved significantly and launched numerous models over two decades of history, including electric versions and models with entirely national engines. The cars produced were considered good, a significant achievement for a recent automaker. Gigel cars were simple and quite captivating. Perhaps the design wasn't their greatest strength, but just like the mentioned large corporations, it was only the beginning of a battle, a Brazilian's fight against the multinational giants. There is a theory that small companies have advantages over giants, and Gigel seemed to be aware of this in 1969. However, in the 90s, Gigel unfortunately went bankrupt. In 2004, the brand was sold for only $850 to Paolo Emilio Freire Lemos. Unlike Ford in the United States, Gigel did not become a national icon. In 2020, a designer named Ray imagined and redesigned one of the brand's best-selling models, resulting in an SUV very similar to the popular ones we see today, including, as you can see on the screen, a resemblance to a current Jeep model. This reinterpretation showed the potential that Gigel could have had if it hadn't been removed from the market. The rise of this company and the reasons for its collapse are what I will explore in this video. Gigel Motors S.A, conceived by a Brazilian visionary, had a promising future that never materialized. To understand this story, we need to know the purpose that motivated its creation. Its founder, João Augusto Conrado do Amaral Gugel, nurtured this dream back in college in the 40s. Fascinated by cars from a young age, Gugel aspired to create a genuinely Brazilian vehicle, and this passion led him to study mechanical engineering at the Polytechnic School of the University of Sao Paulo. His obsession was so great that he almost failed his final course project. Defying the professor's guidance to develop a crane, Gigel chose to build a car. The professor's reaction was a reminder that would accompany him throughout his journey, you can't manufacture a car, you buy automotive technology. It's the business of multinational companies. After standing out as a student, Gigel was awarded a scholarship at the General Motors Institute in the United States. During his internship at General Motors factories, he witnessed significant advancements in automotive manufacturing technology, including the introduction of reinforced plastic. This innovative material would later be introduced to the market with the launch of the Chevrolet Corvette. Upon returning to Brazil, Gigel spent some time working at the local branches of General Motors and Ford. The Brazilian automotive industry, which emerged during Getulio Vargas' era with the creation of the National Steel Company, gained momentum in the 1950s. 
During this period, Juscelino Kubitschek implemented a policy of economic development that included incentives for the national automotive industry. In 1956, Kubitschek established the Executive Group for the Automotive Industry GIA, an agency whose mission was to oversee standards and create conditions for the emergence of a national automotive industry. Vigel participated in this group for a while, however, these efforts were still not enough. In the 1960s, cars were as expensive as they are today. For example, a combi van cost around 11,300 new cruzeros, while the minimum wage at the time was about 150 new cruzeros. This means that a Brazilian would need to save more than 70 salaries to buy an entry-level car in cash, a situation very similar to the current one that we have talked about extensively on this channel. With the idea of offering a more accessible car, Gigel founded Gigel Motors, an initiative to promote a more inclusive Brazilian automotive industry. Gigel needed resources to produce his first cars. Before establishing his company, he manufactured components for the Home and Arrow, the first Brazilian passenger car. He also gained fame for producing acrylic light panels. He liked to describe his company as a very national one, not a national mammoth. This philosophy was reflected in the names of the brand's vehicles. The first was the Macango Gigel 1200, a bug nicknamed Ipanema that used Volkswagen chassis and engine. Being a Volkswagen dealer, Gigel persuaded the company's president to supply the chassis for the production of the Ipanema. At the car show, Gigel received 200 orders for the model, so he sold his dealership for $50, which he invested in Gigel Motors of Brazil. Noticing that the buggy Ipanema was frequently used on rough terrains, he decided to launch the Zavanti XT. This model had a plastic-inspired chassis, similar to the reinforced plastic of the Corvette that he had seen at General Motors, and a suspension developed by himself. This model was followed by the Chavantes XTC and the X12. The X12 became the company's biggest sales success and was produced for 20 years until the company went bankrupt. Despite not having four-wheel drive, the X12 was praised for its off-road performance. In an interview with TV Manchette in 1988, Gigel advocated for the idea that it was time for Brazilians to build their own cars, designed and manufactured within the country. He argued that the technology already existed and that, thanks to the contribution of multinational companies, the country already had qualified engineers to produce a completely national car. Within Gigel, the company developed Brazil's first electric car and also Latin America's long before companies like Toyota and Tesla adopted water-cooled motors following a global trend to replace air-cooled engines. Gigel was the stage for several original solutions that led to a series of patents, one of which was Plastel, a chassis that combined plastic and steel. Gigel proved to be an innovative company by creating the cell attraction system, allowing their Jeeps to overcome obstacles with only two-wheel drive, making their models competitive against the 4x4 off-road vehicles of the time, with a much better cost-benefit ratio. However, the brand's electric vehicle, Itape UE 150, did not achieve the same success. Gigel was a critic of Prolcor, a national program launched by the federal government in the 1970s to stimulate ethanol production as a response to the oil crisis that led to high oil prices. He argued that land should be devoted to food production, not fuels. In his view, electricity was the fuel of the future. The Atape UE-150, the brand's electric car, was a compact vehicle capable of accommodating up to two people with a top speed of 60 km per hour. However, it did not reach mass production due to problems with battery weight, low range, and long recharging time. For example, this model needed about 10 hours of charging to achieve a range of 50 km. Gigel attempted to improve the car's efficiency by increasing battery range and reducing charging time. 
However, the lack of support from the federal government hindered progress, resulting in Brazil's and Latin America's first electric car remaining only a prototype. This prototype was a promising start, and that is the great tribute to Gigel. Despite the initial difficulties, the project had great potential. Small companies face obstacles before becoming big, and continuous effort in product improvement is essential for growth. Another model from the brand, the Itapu E400, an electric van, was produced with about 1,000 units manufactured. However, these vehicles were mainly used by telecommunications companies like Telebras and Telesp. Gigel continued innovating, presenting models like Caraja's XEFX15, X20 Super Mini, among others, and the Motor Elytron, which marked the era. One of Gigel's most notable projects was the Caro Economico Nazionale, originally named Senna. However, the Senna family sued Gigel to prevent the use of that name due to its phonetic similarity to the racer's name. The model was then renamed to BR800 and was initially sold along with shares of the company under the slogan, Do You Dare to Be a Partner? This allowed Gigel to obtain 100% Brazilian capital to reinvest in the company. The BR800 was well received and was 30% cheaper than the Fiat Uno. By the end of 1989, a thousand units were produced. However, little more than a year later, the government reduced the IPI excise tax for vehicles up to 1,000 cubic centimeters from 40% to 20%. A specific clause in Decree 99.349 made all the difference, meaning that Gigel would have to pay 20% IPI on their BR800, just like any other motor up to 1,000 cubic centimeters. Interestingly, Fiat quickly launched its 1,000 cubic centimeters motor for the Uno, fitting into the new decree. Other manufacturers took more than a year and a half to adapt. Fiat seemed to act swiftly. But, in reality, they quickly altered their 1,050 cubic centimeters motor to make it fit the new regulations, becoming 1,000 cubic centimeters. Ironically, the BR800 was the beginning of the end for Gigel. However, that doesn't tell the whole story. Brazil's dependency on foreign car manufacturers is a long-lasting fact, cultivated and especially prominent in the 90s. That decade witnessed a complex mix of circumstances that led to the bankruptcy of the national automotive industry, including the opening of the market to international car manufacturers and the absence of a policy protecting the domestic industry. Gigel found itself in a challenging scenario, culminating in its demise. Paolo, an economics professor at the Getulio Vargas Foundation, in a 2021 article, pointed to a lobby for reducing IPI for motors up to 1,000 cubic centimeters as the main cause of Gigel's bankruptcy. He described how, while the company focused on producing vehicles for niche markets without threatening major brands, it made profits. However, when it attempted to enter the production of popular urban cars, the scenario changed dramatically in response to the invasion of foreign car manufacturers. Gigel launched a new project, the Progito Delta, aiming to create a popular car with production anchored in a factory in Serra. However, to realize this venture, it needed government support from the states of Serra and Sao Paulo, as well as BNDS, National Bank for Economic and Social Development. While trying to make this new project feasible, the factory in Rio Claro stopped operating due to a strike by customs inspectors, causing delays in gearbox supplies, and the company started losing money and financial support. At this point, the situation became even more complex. Fernando Gugel, son of João Gugel, the company's founder, accused the governments of not honoring promised loans. At the time, the governor of Serra countered, saying that Gigel did not fulfill its financial commitments. As such, the story has multiple versions, and achieving complete clarity on what really happened is difficult. According to Paolo Gala, 
three events marked the end of Gigel. First, the car manufacturer's lobby managed to obtain tax exemptions for 1.0 cars. Then, the manufacturers pressured auto part suppliers to prevent parts created for a specific brand from being used by other brands. This directly affected Google, which used to reuse parts. In 1993, the production of the X12, the last model still in production since the arrival of multinational companies, was severely reduced, shaking Google's relationship with Volkswagen. Lastly, the BNDS delayed the release of approved funds, complicating the construction of the new factory in Serra. The Gigel project had a significant differentiator, the Plastal Platform, a system patented by the company. Currently, more advanced versions of this system are employed by high-performance brands like Porsche, Ferrari, and even Bugatti. However, the combination of these challenges led Gigel to bankruptcy. Without government support, the company filed for bankruptcy in 1993 and requested a $20 million loan from the federal government to keep the factory running. The request was denied, and the company declared bankruptcy in 1994. It remained active until September 1996, but little could be done in the meantime. The Volkswagen Gol became the best-selling car in Brazil in 2007. The first and most prolific factory of the AD Rio Claro company was auctioned for 16 million reais, but the company left about 280 million reais in debt. Countries like Japan, with vast experience, can manufacture better, more efficient, faster, and cheaper vehicles than Brazil, but they had to learn to become what they are today. Even after being devastated in World War II, it would have been wise to buy cars from them. However, it is inspiring to see Brazilians striving to change this reality and face international giants, as the aforementioned companies did. What Joao Gugel did was exactly that. He was a man who believed in Brazil and wanted to turn it into a protagonist in the global automotive scenario, rather than just receiving foreign products. Unfortunately, Brazil went in the opposite direction, where, made in Brazil, is seen with disdain, and imported products are synonymous with superiority. Times have changed, but not entirely. Today, the biggest adversary of the Brazilian people is the government itself, which, instead of encouraging progress and the well-being of Brazilians, seems to disregard it. They might have never truly loved the country, or this sentiment was quickly replaced by love for the party, political positions, favors, bribes, and even nepotism. Interestingly, when searching for Gigel car models for sale on Google, the first result is a car located in location where correct decisions could have made a difference for Gigel. Joao Gigel passed away in January 2009. Currently, the top 10 best-selling car brands in Brazil are all foreign. But for most people, Brazil is no longer a dream of having a factory, let alone something that justifies the costs of manufacturing cars on national soil. The truth is that some companies have realized this and started leaving the country because they found more profit outside Brazil. That's exactly what I discuss in this video about Ford, which is currently playing on your screen. If you liked it, leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel, enabling notifications, as I post new videos every day. See you in the next one.